Praise the Lord. Praise him, you servants of the Lord. Bless God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be his name, now and forever. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let us confess our sins. Almighty God, our Amen. Heavenly Father, in penitence we confess that we have sinned against you through our own fault, in thought, word, and deed, and in what we have left undone. For the sake of your Son, Christ our Lord, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Almighty God, for you all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon your sins, and set you free from them. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord of heaven and earth, you sent your Holy Spirit to be the life and power of your church. Sow in our hearts the seeds of grace, that we may bring forth the fruit of the Spirit through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
A reading from Genesis chapter 28, beginning at the 10th verse. Jacob left Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to the heaven and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I'll give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and I'll bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I've done what I have promised to you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He, he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> a reading from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, beginning at the 12th verse. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to be sinful nature to live according to it. For if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear but you receive the spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father, the spirit himself testifies with our spirits that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, we have the fruit, first fruits of the spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were served, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he has already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it impatiently. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
listen to the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ proclaimed in the gospel according to St. Matthew in chapter 13 beginning to read at the 24th verse. Jesus told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while everyone was sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed ears, then the weeds also appeared. The owner's servants came to him and said, Sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? An enemy did this, he replied. The servants asked him, Do you want us to go and pull them up? No, he answered, because while you are pulling up the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. Then he left the cloud and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. He answered, The one who sowed the good seed is the son of man. The field is a world and the good seed stands for the people of a kingdom. The weeds are the people of the evil one. And the enemy who sows them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age and the harvesters are angels. As the weeds are pulled up and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels and they will weed out the kingdom, everything that causes sin and all who do evil. They will throw them into the blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father, whoever has ears, let them hear. This is the gospel of Christ. Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through whom all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets, we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. So for those of you who aren't aware, we do record this sermon. It becomes part of what is sent out this evening. So I do want to bid those of you who join us in the evening welcome. We acknowledge your presence with us and we are so aware of the communion of the saints. So how do you feel about this morning's parable in the Gospel of Matthew? I have to make a confession. I find that whenever I read 
this particular parable, I actually feel quite sad and upset. I feel sad for the weeds. I don't want the weeds to be thrown into the fiery furnace. They didn't ask to be born weeds. And it's also, I feel, an unjust and unfair practice to delegate and to put weeds into the, into the compost heap or wherever else we may throw them. Because there is the sense in which when we label a plant a weed, we feel they are discardable. When last did you go and Google some of the weeds and what their properties are? Go and do yourself a favor, go and look. Go and look at dandelion, go and look at nettles. You'll be surprised. They have some wonderful health filled properties. But perhaps my upsetness, my sadness about what happens to weeds that didn't ask to be born about weeds is because I've taken it too literally. Any parable has to be taken within the context of the gospel itself because a parable doesn't tell the entire story, it's just part of it. And we have to acknowledge that it's allegorical. It is not the whole literal story. And when we look at some of the other meanings around it, hopefully we'll discover that it's not quite so fiery and violent as what appears at first glance. Let's begin by exploring the seeds which then develop into the plants. On the one hand, the good seed seems to be a crop of wheat. And the seed sown by an enemy, it doesn't say the enemy, but an enemy who remains anonymous. And notice there's no consequence to this enemy, nothing happens to them. That enemy sows whatever those seeds are, depending on which Bible you read, they're either called weeds or they're called tares. Now in the original text, and it's quite rare that you would find this accurate translation into English, but then the original text, the Greek word that is used there is zizania. And zizania, more accurately translated, is darnel. Some of you may know darnel. It's a form of rye grass, and it mimics, by its exterior appearance, it mimics wheat. In the Journal of Ethnobiology, Howard Thomas, who is a professor of biology, writes, Where there is darnel, there is treachery. Oh my word, talk about bad press. Those seem to be pretty extreme words, especially when they present darnel as a kind of evil twin of wheat. But when we go to the Latin name for darnel, we've Start finding other clues about its properties. I am not a Latin scholar, so forgive me if I mispronounce it. There are two words for Donald. It's called Lomium Temulentum. That's more or less how it's spelled. It's a very long word, Temulentum. And what's fascinating about it is the word that we get in English for drunk is found in its core from that word, temeritin. So drunk is derived from that. Apparently, if you were to go and eat some, I don't mean go and overload on it, but if you were to eat some of the seeds of Donald, what you may experience is dizziness, a loss of balance, and nausea. But, and you may want to go and experiment here, but don't say that I told you to do it. But if you were to take just a little bit of dark and put it into either some beer or into some bread, it gives you this wonderful sense of euphoria, a bit of an eye. <laughs> However, if you put a very, very, very big dose, so if you were eat, to eat a lot of seeds, it actually can kill you. It's quite an interesting plant, this. So then, how do you tell the difference if Donald looks as a young plant? 
If you had to put a young darnel plant and a young wheat plant, how would you tell the difference between the two? Actually, you can't. They are very, very similar. And that's why it's dangerous to take darnel out from amongst the wheat. And you notice that the farmer or the landowner, when the slaves come and say, oh, an enemy has sown some darnel, some of these weeds, in the midst of the wheat, he says, leave them to grow side by side. Because if you were to remove the darnel, your chances are you would remove just as much wheat because it's so difficult to tell the difference. Also, one of the things darnel does is its roots grow around the roots of wheat. So again, if you were to remove it, you would remove a lot of the wheat. And then that would mean that the farmer wouldn't have a crop of wheat, or certainly not adequate enough to store and to sell it. It would affect economically that entire family. But when the darnel and the wheat become mature and the fruits start appearing, that's when you can start telling the difference. So when the darnel is mature, it remains standing upright. But when wheat has ripening ears of corn on it, the weight of those ripe ears are so heavy that the wheat droops over. And that's how you know the difference. The fruitfulness makes it other and visibly other. And that's so helpful, isn't it? And did you know, you might remember this, that in Matthew as well, in chapter 7, we hear that it's by their fruits they shall be known. And that's the same for us as believers as well. So as you can see, it takes time, it takes patience for the fruit to emerge and then to become the identity by which one can identify the darnel and the wheat, which comes from God, the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians, and which doesn't come from God. Part of what this implies, if you were just to read the parable as it is, which is unfortunate, but it implies that if you are darnel, shame, you're kind of stuck with that. And it's a, it feels like such an unjust predestination. But if you read the whole of Matthew's Gospel, which is what any allegory invites us into, we see that even darnel can be transformed. And maybe the wheat can help with the transformation of that. And that's what it's meant to be. There's always meant to have that hope behind anything that we read. So how does this parable apply to us today? How does it make sense of our world that we find ourselves in? So let's be honest. If not to one another, at least to ourselves. How many of you actually feel really deeply satisfied when somebody who's done really bad and evil things, when they actually do get punished for it, that they get their due come up I suspect quite a lot of us feel quite glad that they've got it. But there are questions that arise out of that. Because if evil is destroyed, which this parable implies by the fiery furnace, why is there still so much evil around? And why does God seemingly not only allow it, but actually allow it to flourish? And then the other thing is, and this again is a question for you and me, who of us at some time were feeling very crusader spirit-like and maybe even secretly, wanted to take matters into our own hands and to root out all the evil that is in our midst. So maybe, and this is very interesting, I don't know how many of you really looked at your parish leaflet, but you would have noticed that the parable is in two parts. There's six verses between the parable 
an explanation. It's felt that actually that explanation was not part of the original gospel. It was put in later. So if that is the case, why did Matthew include that parable? He's the only gospel who has this parable. Many theologians feel that it's because of the congregation that he was part of. And that there were possibly quite a big, strong group in that congregation who were very over-enthusiastic weeders out of any people in that community who were not good seed and they wanted to purify the community. They, they took judgment into their own hands. And so Matthew wanted to tell this story to help them look at themselves. The sadness is, isn't it, that it didn't only belong to them. It's also so much part of our lives in today. Followers of Jesus Christ throughout the centuries seem at some or other time to have gone on a bit of a weeding frenzy. Just look at the Crusades. After all, we can become very self-righteous and say, oh, we know the right interpretations of Scripture. We know the right liturgical practice, the right stand on any particular issue. Or we even feel that we have the right to pronounce judgment on people of other faiths or no faith at all. This parable, especially in the explanation, is very adamant and clear that God is the judge. And it's represented by the angels. They do the judging. God is the judge, not us. Our role is to have a mission of bringing to bear the kingdom of God, making it known and manifest through our lives that people are aware of the presence of God in the kingdom of God right here and right now. Just by the way, I think we're going to be very surprised by who's in heaven because God really does judge differently. It's very hard to get away from God's love. You've got to work hard not to go to heaven. And furthermore, and this may sound like a cliche, but it's one of those cliches that holds true. It really, really is only God who authentically knows what is in a person's heart. There's often so much more going on inside of any one person than we can see on the surface. We are seldom as fully insightful as we think we are. Let's just Let's assume for once that we don't know. Rather than assuming just because we know some little part that we know the whole of anybody. Besides which, we know life is far more complex than the oversimplistic view that this parable even presents of good and bad, black and white. Life is much more about striations of grey. And that applies to each one of us as well. Nobody is all good and nobody is all bad. For the early church, and hopefully for us too, this is a reminder that even congregations of believers are not perfect. You know that quote. If you find a perfect church, don't join it because then it's not perfect anymore. <laughs> the people then, as now, were and are a motley group of people. We are a mixture of saints and sinners. We have different abilities. We are on different levels of maturity and understanding. We have different understandings of morality and where we are growing into in that. And then just for a last word, we have to say, what about the buyer? We can't avoid that image, much as I find it very uncomfortable. But is it possible, and I believe it is, that the buyer is not a representation of hell and damnation and of a consignment of anyone or anything into burning into eternity? It's not about violence and destruction. 
Maybe it's much more about purification. In the Bible, especially in the Hebrew scriptures, we often hear that we are purified like silver. We are cleansed ongoingly from those impurities. Do you know how a silversmith knows? When he's smelting the silver, she's smelting the silver. Do you know how they know when the silver is ready and it's pure? They know because they can see the reflection of their own faces in that silver. And likewise, when you and I are constantly allowing the Spirit to clear the impurities from our lives, Others will start seeing the reflection of Jesus' face in us. So at the end of the day, the wheat neither rejects nor destroys the darnel, nor does it even remove itself from the vicinity of the darnel. The wheat stays in companionship with the darnel, hopefully influencing it and maintaining its own wheatiness to the glory of God and for the nourishment of the entire world. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have taught us to pray and to give thanks for all people. Receive our prayers for the Universal Church, that it may know the power of your Spirit, and that all your children may agree in the truth of your Holy Word and live in unity and godly love. We pray for your servant Steve, our Bishop, together with Tabo, our Metropolitan, and for all other ministers of your Word and Sacraments that by their life and teaching, your glory may be revealed in all nations, drawn to you. Guide and prosper, we pray, those who strive for the spread of your gospel, and enlighten with your spirit all places of work, learning, and healing. We pray for those who have authority and responsibility among the nations, that, ruling with wisdom and justice, they may promote peace and well-being in the world. To this congregation and to all your people in their different callings, give your heavenly grace that we may hear your holy word with reverent and obedient hearts and serve you truly all the days of our life. In your compassion, Father, comfort and heal those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, or sickness. We praise and thank you for all your saints, for the Blessed Virgin Mary, the Mother of Jesus Christ our Lord, and for the heroes of the faith in every generation, and we remember before you your servants who have died, praying that we may enter with them into the fullness of your unending joy. Grant this, Holy Father, 
for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. <laughs>
Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Mm-hmm. And so we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Remembering therefore his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you've made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church, gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth, that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant Jesus Christ. All glory and honour are yours, Father, and Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The bread which you break, is it not the sharing of the body of Christ? We who are we many are one body, body for we all partake of the one bread. bread. Jesus, Lamb of God, have, have mercy, mercy on us. us. Jesus, bearer of our sins, have, have mercy, mercy on us. us. Jesus, Jesus Redeemer of the world, give us, give us your peace. We do not presume to come to this your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose nature is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us.
Christ, sanctify me. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, refresh me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O good Jesus, hear me. Within your wounds, hide me. Let me never be separated from you. From the malicious enemy, defend me. In the hour of my death, call me and bid me come to you, that with your saints I may praise you forever and ever. Amen.
Give thanks to the Lord, for he is gracious. His mercy endures forever. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for feeding us in these holy mysteries through the body and blood of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and for keeping us by your grace in the body of your Son, the company of all faithful people. Help us to persevere as living members of that holy fellowship, and to grow in love and obedience according to your will, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. And may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the, in the name, name of Christ. Christ. Amen. Amen.